So welcome everybody. Um, this is uh, another conversation in the Heart Community Group series. Um, well, I'm not sure where it comes. It could be under uh, living well now. It could be uh, adapting for an uncertain future. It kind of crosses both of those, but uh, absolutely delighted to welcome Michael Shaw, uh, the creator of the documentary Living in, a, <coughs> Living in the Time of Dying. And I hope that you've all had a chance to watch that documentary. Uh, and um, we're just going to be having a conversation about um, what we can learn from that and, and what Michael's learned from that actually. So Michael, just kind of say hi and uh, what you're up to in the world now. Mm. Well, um, hello and great great to um, be with you, Kimberly. Um, it's always an honour to be asked to be interviewed. Um, so up to in the world now, uh, I, I run groups um, which, which are morphing probably into what I'd call grief groups. Um, but essentially, we meet to talk about collapse um, freely and openly, uh, which is seeming to be quite a rare thing that people have. And when I say a grief group, uh, I mean free to talk about the grief, free to talk about the anger, free to talk about the openings and the understandings and the blessings of this time as well. So all of these things are conversations that can be very, very difficult to have uh, in the in the world as it is now. So I do that. I'm also a therapist. Um, so I see clients. Um, and as I was saying when we were chatting, uh, I live probably half a K from the beach. I walk every day on the beach. I see most sunrises as they come. And I, I probably align my life to a mixture of following the calling of what I feel that I need to be doing now and also listening to what brings me joy and what I need to do to take care of my spirit. So, so a mixture of those two things. And I personally find uh, that connecting with people and finding heart connections with people uh, is incredibly important time on my own is incredibly important. So um, all of those things. And it's nice to be able to uh, introduce myself without a, a CV, if you know what I mean. Um, there was a time I did an anti-bullying group into schools for, for many, many years I did that. Uh, but it, it's so far in my past now that the, this, this work here feels uh, like is where my life really started. If, if I can say that, it's a strange thing to say, but it's it's how it, it feels true. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. So just turning to the documentary, which um, mm. I, I loved and I've watched it several times and I each time it's funny, I kind of get more from it. Mm. Uh, but um, what, what have been some of your insight? Because we're now, how many years on? Was that 2019 or? 2019, although it got released, basically I released it. I, I, I made a cut. I was so full of urgency. I mean, I have to say, I had never made a documentary before. I had never even wanted to make a documentary before. That came to me uh, in a meditation retreat. And literally it was just like, you have to do this. And uh, I had no idea the, how complicated that would be <laughs> or how much that would cost. I had no idea. So I was really following uh, a, a very pure impulse. Um, what, would, what was the question? You, the question, what, what I, I missed the question now, I've lost it. I was, I was just trying to kind of pinpoint the date and here we are in 2020. Oh, yes, no, I released it straight away and then it got about... Um, 30,000 views and I spoke to you know other people other filmmakers and they said oh you've got to put it into film festivals you know because you get it into film festivals and you get if you can get awards then people are more interested in watching it so I took it down I went through the whole process of putting it into film festivals and upgrading the sound and re-editing it so then it went out again really just six months ago and um 
with those awards, it's, you know, it's gotten like 300,000 views now. So I'll, I'll know for next time about how to release because this I didn't know either at the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And other than, you know, I'm sure you, you learned loads about documentary making, obviously. Yes. But in terms of the content. Yes. What were some of the, the biggest insights that you had, you know? Well, it's massive insights. I mean, the very first one, uh, which is maybe the most significant, is that doco, because I was a very good friends with Catherine Ingram, and we had maybe sort of, you know, two or three years of talking about what was going on with the climate and civilization before I moved uh, into making that documentary. And I'd have to, I have to say, I, I fell into a bit of despair. Like the grief was very, very deep when I traveled into that. And Catherine was smart enough to let me go there and uh, not try to rush that process and just allow it. And it's not that I got to the end of a grief process and then I moved into this. It's like from that grief process, the urgency of making that documentary came. So that what to do for me came right out of the middle of that grief. And there's a lesson in that because I think uh, people trying to head to acceptance to find what it is they have to do. It's like, let the grief speak. Let the grief speak to you and uh, let that move you and let that let, just be open to what that says about what needs to happen. So, so uh, after I'd finished the documentary um, and then it was like, well, what do I do now? Um, one of the things that stayed with me was it was so important for me to have places to talk about what was going on. The people that I could talk to were gold. And so hence I started the groups now because of that need, like responding to that need. I mean, there's a quote from Stephen Jenkinson that, um, that I said when we were talking a, a few days ago, uh, when, when what troubles you is what's troubling the world, true citizenship is born. And I, I just love that from Stephen Jenkinson. And I feel like, you know, is people talking about they're going to grief going to make one piece of difference to what's going on? No. <laughs> is it feels like my thing to do? Yes. Does um, coming into a softer relationship with grief feel very, very important to me in terms of collapsing more gently? Yes, it does. So I pick my piece to do and I'm doing my piece. And in a sense, it's a little bit like um, uh, I was walking this morning thinking about this, a bit like a Tibetan sand mandala, that they make those beautiful sand mandalas, uh, you know, for festivals and in honouring visitors, and then it's swept away. Yeah. And that, that, that idea of giving great love with no attachment <laughs> to it remaining feels you know that speaks in my heart very deeply and because if I was attached to making a difference to the outcome I couldn't do anything <laughs> I'd be frozen you know I wouldn't be able to think so it's just picking up the piece that's that's mine to do and I'm lucky that I found it. it's a blessing that I found it yeah fantastic fantastic yeah. Yeah, and as you know, my my kind of thread in all of this is is very mm. much about supporting people in finding what is theirs to do. And I think there's yes. a big difference between, you know, doing good work and doing my work. Yes, like, they're not. You know, it's all good work, but we have it has to kind of come from within. Um, yes. Yeah. Very good. So um, I wanted to. I wanted to ask you about the Hopi prophecy, Michael, and I know yes. um, we talked about this before, and this, this was a prophecy that came to Meg Wheatley, who, yes. who you, know, you know, who's another wonderful human being, mm -hmm. and does a lot of work developing what she calls warriors for the human spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she shared it with you, and uh, I know we, we have permission for you to share it. Would you, would you do that? And would you read it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, quite, quite I'm slowly. Yes, yeah, um, I'm happy to do that. 
uh, with the uh, with the understanding, uh, you know, I'm in no way authorized. Um, you know, given the given the um, uh, given the task of sharing this, this is something Meg Meg was was given this by a hype carrier in 2009, and the prophecy came in 2000. Um, and I've spoke I've spoken with Meg, and you know, it's like, is it okay to share this? And it's I'm not an authority on this Hopi prophecy. I'm just reading it because it was read to me. Yeah. So there's a verse that um, she didn't read uh, in that interview with her. And that interview is great if anyone wants to go and look at that on my channel, uh, Living in the Time of Dying. But here it is. You have been telling people this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour. And there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It's time to speak your truth. Create your communi community. Be good to each other. And do not look outside yourself for the leader. This could be a good time. There is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those that will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are being torn apart and they will suffer greatly. Know the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore. Push off into the middle of the river and keep your eyes open and your heads above water. See who is there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth journey comes to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration, for we are the ones we've been waiting for. Gets me every time. <laughs> Gets me every time gets me every time as well. And, and you know, I'd love to ask you what, what you kind of take from that um, mm. specifically. I love the kind of don't take it personally and, mm. and that helps us not be victims in all of this. Yes. Uh, what, what else do you take from it? Well, there's so much, you know, I, I feel like, um, I feel like we could, you know, run a four day weekend on this prophecy. But, um, you know, pick off some of the pieces um, and, and, you know, my personal take on some of the pieces, you know, who, you know, I, I'm just what it's how it speaks to me. First of all, that uh, that bit about the river and pushing off into the middle of the river and uh, see who is there with you and celebrate. And that uh, that idea of sort of letting go of your life as you had planned it your visions for your future as you had planned it, your ideas as you planned it, you know, your, I mean, we were so, because of the culture that we're in, we're often so driven by these egoic ideas of I want to be this, I want to be that, I want to be paid this, I want to own this. It's like, let go. It's the big let go. And when we let go, uh, there's forces, I think, that can take care of us, you know, and, and, you know, that that's not to say that's a protection uh, against any kind of suffering or death. It's just forces that can protect us as we do that. And the other thing that I always think about when this, um, uh, what is it? Uh, um, this idea of, um, the, the honouring the spiritual in this, I do feel 
and this relates back to your question at the very beginning in terms of what I might have learned from the documentary. Climate, climate change as a spiritual teacher. I, I know Jonathan Guston's doing a whole series on this, but outside of that series, that idea speaks very loudly in me. Like I've had spiritual teachers. You know, I've been a, a big time seeker, really. I've had three different teachers um, that I've spent a great deal of time with and um, uh, given a lot of my energy to. And each time one of those teachers has come in, my life has changed. And I, I'm brought to my knees uh, in humility and understanding of a bigger picture. And this now, climate change, feels like the biggest of all the spiritual teachers. It's life speaking. And what's important? You know, where's my humility? What can I offer? And not, oh, I'm too small to offer anything. Like it's going to, that's going to get smashed out of the way as well. You know, that egoic piece of I'm too small to give it gone. Like, what am I called to do? You know, what is this spiritual teacher asking of me? And that listening uh, is very profound. It's very profound. And, and, it doesn't matter, like, my ideas of the future. It doesn't matter. What matters is my worship uh, and, you know, keeping my heart as clean as I possibly can in these times and, and being of service. Someone uh, in one of our groups uh, sent me an email um, saying that they're giving blood now. It's like they just had that thought of that's how I can be of service. It's like... There's always something, you know, whenever I see people um, begging on the streets, I give them something. I look them in the eyes. I say hello, you know, like that, that's, that's a minuscule piece of service in a way. But because service is rotating in my body, uh, it's like when it's called, I listen. It's like I'm in relationship with my guru called, uh, you know, climate collapse um, civilizational collapse. I'm in relationship with that and I'm here of service. And yeah, uh, so it's a, it's a mix of like the biggest catastrophe that we could ever imagine, the biggest coming to grips with what our culture is really about that you could ever imagine. And you, you know, if you look at Indigenous history, you start to understand the violence at the, that's at the heart of our culture. So understanding how we've gotten here is also part of it. What is this culture? How am I programmed by this culture in my expectations and in my relationship with other people? How's that operating with me? Is there a bigger way for me to operate now that this whole thing's coming down? What's the truth? You know, what is my big self? Do I die when I die? Like, who am I getting my instructions from here? Like, like these questions are profound yeah. and grief is profound. Yeah. And to honour, you know, um, uh, um, Francis Weller, you know, talks about uh, grief and gratitude and if we spend too much time in grief, we might become bitter. And if we just spend too much time in gratitude, we might become shallow. And this idea of bringing grief and gratitude together as a prayer to life, our great teacher of life, our place on this planet, life, I feel, uh, you know, that's constant uh, focus. It's a, it's a constant readjusting. Of, of my position so but i've moved away from the hopi prophecy pretty fast there uh and there's so much in it so please do feel free to go back yeah no it was just one more thing about it that really came through to me that the middle of the river yes is that place of service yes and you know really su but, but supporting others as well in that process of letting go of the shore Yes, because it's um, it can be hard depending on who else you have around you and how how tight they're clinging to the shore as well. Yes, 
Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, no, uh, as you say, we could we could spend the whole hour just. Yeah. But it is, you know, it's a very beautiful prophecy. And I know when Meg got this, um, uh, you know, they were, she was also told at the time that people were sensing what was coming and people were saying, what do we do? And the instruction was, go to the prophecy. Right, right. Yeah. That you, was the instruction, yeah. Because you, you read out a slightly different version. Would you be so good as to email me that tech, that full sure. tech? Sure. The, the first bit is just she didn't read out. Yeah. Uh, so it's the same. It's the it's the true version that yeah. just that Meg started straight at the river. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, but even this even this part, like you've been telling people this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell them this is the hour. Yes. Now, you know, you you can say on one level, it's like, oh, shit. You know, that's very threatening, isn't it? You know, how threatening is that? This is the hour. But at the same time, it's like now. If you want to make amends with people, now. Do you know, if there's people you need out of your life, now. You know, if there's something that's being called to do, now. Now is the hour. So, so um, yeah, so it's part inspiration. And, and, you know, it's using fear to be inspirational. Yeah. you know if you like yeah uh, yes it, it reminds me in a you know in a way of the same message that you know Rupert Reed is 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 going around making now with his climate majority project um although he's probably uh <clears throat> more optimistic than 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 you are but it's his message at the moment is very much it's not five to midnight it's gone midnight yes. <laughs> you know and yeah. And actually this narrative of it's five to midnight, you know, um, like that's been going on for 30 years. Yes, it has. Yeah. Yes, it has. And, um, and uh, you know, and actually I, getting, getting in the way now because it allows a kind of soft denial. Um, yes, yes, it does. You know, you know, if we don't do something in the next 10 years, you know, all, all of that garbage. Um, but I, I, I like you know, Meg, Meg Wheatley's take on this, which is how to collapse more gently. And um, can we play a hand in collapsing more gently? You know, I'm up for that. Uh, you know, I'm up for that task. Anything I can give to that task, I'll, I'll give. Yeah, fantastic. So I'm gonna, gonna open it up for your questions in a moment, um, lovely group. Um, mm. So, Feel free to start typing those in the chat now. I just have one more, and you've kind of talked about this already a bit, and it's kind of given, given that you think we're off the cliff already, mm. what, what nourishes you? Yes, look, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I, I put this to my the groups that that I lead often. And um Many things nourish me, and in no particular order, uh, time alone, like time alone to feel what I feel and be with myself is, uh, is a gift that I give to myself. I need that to kind of come home. Um, I, I'm very lucky to have a, a beloved uh, that I share time with. Uh, that's on the same page as me. We can talk, um, we can play, enjoy life. You know, you know that's nourishing. Um, being with friends, you know, not all of them that see things the same way as I do either. Um, uh, um, sharing deep conversations, you know, being on people's cutting edge. Uh, I find that incredibly nourishing. You know, I, I feel like don't have time to listen to your stories of what you're going to be doing in 10 years time. I don't have time for that long term plan now. I want to know where your edge is now. And um, so being with people that can go there, uh, I love that. Being in nature, you know, this morning, I went down to the beach this morning and sometimes it happens, particularly when I first get out of bed and um it can happen in the morning that I wake up and go, oh, God, I feel the weight of our times 
and the shortness of time. And, um, you know, in with that, my mother's dying of cancer, my sister's probably dying of cancer too. There's there's quite a bit of like um, the personal grief stories that never go away anyway, so I can wake up like that. And I walk down the beach kind of in that and then just sort of maybe 10 metres out in the sea, and I don't know what sort of bird it was, but it bent its wings and just dove in and came out with a fish and flew away. And it was just like, you know, it's like, I, I don't know, it's like a Zen poem, you know. So, so there's that nourishment of, of being taken by surprise by the beauty of nature again and again and again. Um, yeah. So no, no shortage of nourishment. And I'm very lucky. You know, I'm very, very lucky. And I, I feel like I need to say that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. So, <clears throat> well, over to you. And um, I uh, don't see any questions yet, but as we're, we're a slightly smaller group than we were expecting, um, we can just kind of go very informally now. Who would like to ask Michael something? Who's curious? And just start. Uh, Chantal, do you have any questions there? Not, ah. in, not in this moment, but Jilly had her hand up. Ah, great. Okay. Jilly, go for it. Hi. Uh, Michael, that is just lovely i thank you you speak in a way that really resonates with me um and um uh, i'm going to read that hopi prophecy again uh, so i have a couple of questions actually are we at liberty to share that yes i i i mean look i i mean i when i if you think about um meg passed it on to me and um and I put it out on a video, so I've shared it, you know. Oh. And um, I, I, I think the only problem, you know, just don't be the expert on the prophecy, do you know. Uh, you know, just don't be, you know, the prophecy's been around since 2000. It's well and truly out there. Many people have seen oh. it. Uh, oh. You know, it's just, you know, it's just that bit, being oh. humble about its presentation. Yes, yeah. I found the metaphor so powerful. Um, really, really resonated. Uh, and um, my actual question, my other question, um, how do you invite people to share their cutting edge? Yeah, look, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good point, isn't it? And uh, I can only say how I do it. Uh, you know, that's all, that's, you know, that's all I've got for me. And part of how I do it is um, I will often lead with what my cutting edge is. Yeah. And um, so I, I don't presume to be, uh, you know, if you're just receiving it, there's a bit of a kind of a hierarchy set up there, you know, mm -hmm. tell me your higher edge and I'll fix you. <laughs> tell me your cutting edge and I'll fix you. Um, so so it might be, in, it might involve me sharing it. So I need a certain amount of trust with someone, you know, or, or you can just be sort of get in there really genuinely and go rather than just how are you, you know, hey, you know, these are tough times. How are you? How are you going? You know, what what's what's moving in your world right now? You know, maybe it's boyfriend troubles. You know, maybe it's car troubles. Maybe it's problem with their kid. Doesn't you know? We we don't always need to go to uh, the big big cutting edge. Um, so so I just tried try to create an honest invitation. I think, um, but I pick my people. <laughs> you know, I do. I pick my people. It's about authenticity, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Mm. Thank you, Jilly. Um, Sue, do you want to ask your question? You're muted, Sue. You're muted, Sue. Right. Hello. Hello. Thank you for your beautiful presentation. I really loved it. Um, it's quite funny that Jilly lives a stone throw 
from me. And she said in slightly different words what I've actually put into the chat, which was really about the same thing about getting the message out to people and wondering how much you actually keep your message for people who've chosen to be with you in a group mm. or your friends who again are chosen. To what extent do you throw it to the winds? Because Julie and I, through XR, have done things on the street. Yes. And this feels somehow, ooh, it's getting to a sort of much more personal, a much more sensitive place in me than the kind of material that we've shared in XR. Mm. Um, so, yes, it's, it's of interest. How widely do you spread your material? Because it, yeah. It, yeah. it's very precious. Yeah. Look, this is a good question. And um, I've wrestled with this question for some years. And I've come to this for myself. And, you know, I always have to preface that. Like, I don't know what's true for anybody else. Um, for myself, I don't want to be in arguments about whether this is happening or not. I I'm just not interested. I could give a shit about the science now. I've had enough of the science. I've heard enough of the science. I don't want to get in scientific debates, right? This is me speaking. What I'm interested in is how does this news affect you, right? So if someone's not in it and they're not affected, then I'm not interested in having that conversation. And if they came to ask me and said, hey, what's really going on? You know, I haven't been looking. I hear you, you know, can you tell me? Of course, oh, I'll share it. But I tend to be selective because it brings a lot of attack and a lot of criticism, you know. Um, you know, and uh, I, I don't have a thick enough skin, I don't think, uh, to do that. You know, so, some people are sort of built for, to build to have that battle in the public. And I take my hat off to them. Uh, it doesn't feel what's true for me, you know, but um, I'm glad there's some people out there saying it loud and proud. Uh, I am glad of that. So, so it's like, um, you know, thank you for doing your work and, and I'll do mine, sort of that type of thing, you know, no, no right answer. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Good, great question. And, and I think I think it, it it's a function. You know, we often talk about the four columns, um, and I think everybody here is pretty familiar with those. But it's it so depends which column you're in, because yeah. you know it's it's kind of if if are you still trying to turn it all around? I guess is is gonna is gonna ha have an impact on. Um, you know how loudly or or where you want to share yeah your truth yeah yeah very good mm. what else we got chantal vicky asked a question vicky yeah thank you michael i really felt deeply moved by what you said um I have difficulty talking to the younger people in my life, mm. my children. Mm. And mm. Um, I tend to not <sighs> talk deeply about these things with them mm. because mm. it's it's so hard. Um, mm. And I just wondered how you dealt with that and felt about it. <sighs> My belt response is that I want to cry, honestly, when I'm asked the question. I feel all the tears coming, do you know? And um, I don't know. I, I do my best with young people. I, I do my best to support young people. Um, I don't have children. I did have a child that died um, at birth many years ago, but I'd never have, I haven't raised children and I know parents, the message that I usually get from parents is, you know, please don't talk about, 
you know, please don't say this, please don't talk about that. You know, we're helping them to plan for this. And um, so most of the time I'm asked to be mute. And um, and I the if young people want to speak about it with me, I would be delighted to accompany them down this path. You know, I used to work in schools. Uh, I have a great love of young people. Um, but the world I grew up in, I mean, look, you know, I, you'd have to say the world, you know, if I was Indigenous at this age, the world I would grow up in was not a pretty place. Uh, but the world I grew up in, I had no idea of of any of this. You know, it was a protected childhood. And so when I think about what they're being asked to meet, um, you know, they're, 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 you know, these 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 people coming into their teens uh, are coming into their, you know, awakening into their strength and vitality in life, also being asked to recognise that something's closing. Uh, the only thing that I... No, I was going to use the words that I used to escape this. And, you know, maybe there's a bit of truth in that, in that little revelation, um, is I think I, 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 that the people that are alive now at whatever age are meant to be here for this. Maybe there's a bigger picture. Maybe there's some blessing that I don't know about that's involved in being alive at a time like this. I, I can't tell, I can't see with my eyes. I try to trust, you know, this thing that's in the Hopi prophecy, like know the river has its destination, that there's a bigger picture going on. And I try to trust that when I'm around people because I find it so heartbreaking, you know. Uh, I'm 62, you know, should death come tomorrow, you know, I give blessings for a very full life. Um, but, the, but the young people, you know, yes. I mean, Meg, you know, Meg, when she was talking about this in my interview about the river, said we need to teach the, the younger ones how to swim, you know, what it means to be swimming, uh, mm -hmm. what it means that they're, that these lives are not going to go in the direction they have planned. And I would love to talk to kids about what that means, but I'm not going to thrust this conversation on them either. Um, so perhaps there'll be more time for that in the times ahead, you know. And, mm. and, and, you know, just staying with this for a minute, if I can, I hope I'm not going on here, but, um, uh, you know, Stephen Jenkinson said one of the things that he aligns that his life with is uh, to imagine that in the future, you know, if, there's some of us survive that a young and a young person approaches him and says, did you know? Right. And what will your answer be? And then the follow-up question that this young person will give to you is what did you do? And so there's another kind of guide to how to live you know, via that question, uh, imagining that encounter that may never happen in the future or it may. Did you know and what did you do? But uh, look, it, it, it's, you know, it's such a big subject and I don't know, there's probably many of you here that have children and grandchildren and, um, you know. So. That's um, so helpful. Thank you. My, mm. my children are in their 20s and even yeah. so I find it really hard to talk to them about this because they are on their track. But this, um, did you know and what did you do? I think that is a really useful tool to speak to anyone about it. Okay. It is, isn't it? It provides a little bit of urgency too. There's that little bit of like, okay, you know, there's a little prick under your seat around, okay, what am I doing? Yeah, who am I being? Yeah. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much, Vicky. I was also very moved by, you know, in, in your documentary, you talk with Dar Jamal, and then there's a longer uh, interview, which is also available on YouTube, just with his longer interview. Yes. And he says in that, doesn't he? Um, the kids were born into this and yes. they, they know a great deal more than we think they do. Yes, yes. Uh, and, yes. and, and, yeah. um, and, yeah. and there's something about, again, if they're open to it, you yeah. know, saying to them, we will, we will, as long as I'm here, we will go through this together and we will, yes. and we will grow through this together. Yeah. Um, so yeah. obviously, yeah. you know, it needs to be age appropriate and all of that. Yeah. But yeah. I, th I think kids know a lot more than we, you know, we, we, we try and be so protective. Yeah. Um, but if yeah, that, 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 that story that he talks about where he's, I think it was his nephew, I can't, I can't remember, um, that approached him and wanted to talk about it. And he went for a walk. He, they went hiking for a few days. And um, he basically Dar said to him, you know, I'm here for you, you know, and I don't mean that in a shallow way. Whenever you want to talk, I'm here. You know, whenever you want advice, I'm here. I'm here. So, you know, being that kind of presence for somebody, uh, for a younger person. Yeah, I mean, he's an incredibly inspiring man, Dajamal. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Vicky. Great, great question. Chantal, go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, you know, a couple of things on that, on that uh, talking to younger people. Um, there are a few things that just have been coming up recently that have really struck me. Um, one is, you know, linked to what Kim has just said, you know, that um, what are we trying to protect? Who are we trying to protect? And where's that coming from? Because, um, you know, often, <laughs> often um, people are, young people especially are, what I thought about was the interview that I heard a while ago where a counsellor was sharing her experience of talking to young people. And uh, she said that um, she asked a young person, a very young person, how, you know, how would you like us to talk to you about the climate crisis and one of the things that really struck me was how the young person said well just tell the truth because if you don't tell the truth we can't trust you and if we don't if I don't trust you I'm not yeah. going to listen to you so yeah. and then there was a sort of a passing comment at the end where the kid said and anyway I'm not stupid so I, I think there's something about recognizing and really speaking yeah. to the wisdom resilience and insight that, that, a, that a child like every other human is born born yes. into and born with yes. and speaking yes. to that part of them that hears truth and um and the other thing is permission you know i think sometimes you know it's about permission too isn't it um when is someone ready and wants to have that conversation and then yes. knowing that you're there ready yes. to have that conver conversation yes. And, and then yes. the other, the third thing that struck me is um, the learning to swim, us all learning to, to swim better together mm -hmm. and individually. And mm -hmm. so what is the swimming? What, what, what are the aspects of the swimming that, that young people need? You know, it strikes me that when I was growing up, I was very attached to all the world, all the stuff that I thought was going to make me happy. Yes. And so learning at a younger age, if needed, about attachment or non-attachment and what that is about um, is a really helpful direction mm. for young mm. people yeah. um, because it's so at odds with the social media, the Insta world, the, you know, it's all stuff and things and everything else. And so I think the sooner we're in those conversations too, mm. the, the better, because it's going to yeah. soften the shock. <laughs> A bit, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. So, so there's just you know some thoughts there. Mm. Thank you, Chantal. Yeah, Great. thanks.
Nikki. Thank you. I'd love to jump in on this as well. As you know, um, those of you who know me, I work at a primary school, Michael. So um, very emotional about this whole subject. And I do, I love the idea of um, letting the young people lead this. So they will ask for what they need. But I do, sorry, I'm very emotional about this. I do feel that, um, as you say, Chantal, we've got to get the, the basics down. We've got to teach love and acceptance and equality and you know all those simple basic human things so that we're growing up caring for each other whoever we are wherever we you know meeting people as we always talk about where they are understanding there's difference and then hopefully you know when the shit does hit the fan we're not going to pick and choose who we want to look after and we can be there for each other as we grow i do sympathize with you Vicky because I've got two sons who are in their 20s and I think they're in that sort of difficult in-betweeny um, children uh, are very good at listening and accepting and moving on um, this is the truth of what they are living at this moment so they've never known any different sort of thing when they're young and they'll ask you a question very deep question you can give them a straight answer and they'll be like okay is it dinner time now? You know, it's moved on. But I do think the, um, the young adults are where it might be a bit more difficult because they, like, they've just start, they've, they've done enough to get onto a journey of whatever this life is supposed to be giving them. And now it, the rug is gonna be pulled out from under them. So um, yeah, that I, I'm challenged with how to deal with that with my one of my sons particularly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we've probably got time for uh, one or two, maybe more questions, and um, and Michael, I also give you an opportunity if there's anything you want to say kind of as we come to the end here, that's been profoundly important for you, um, that we might go away and reflect on. But yeah, anybody else want to ask something? Wendy, I'm dying to hear from you because I've never had a conversation with you, but I don't want to force a question for you either. It's just that I, I, I've had you in my periphery for so many years. Yeah, I don't know if there's exactly. anything kind of... Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I'm curious because I have a couple of friends in New Zealand and one or two deep adaptation people and a lot of South African school friends in Australia. And um, I know, I mean, you're down the opposite time zone to us. So there's just not that much interaction. How are people responding to the terrible climate effects that you people have had down there? I mean, everywhere in the world, it's obvious now. Are you seeing, I mean, I vaguely follow, well, I don't follow Australian politics because I don't know what's going on, but I see it coming up. And it seems to me you've had a change to a, a less conservative government. Are yes. you seeing any action? I mean, I don't have hope that we're going to fix this. I'm yes. just looking for governments to actually respond with concern <sighs> while putting, you know, deep adaptation type things in place. And I just, I don't see it. Are you uh, no, no deep, no deep adaptation. I mean, you know, more like we're going to have more green energy, uh, yeah. more electric cars, you know, uh, that's the path. Um, that the Labour government wants to go down. I much prefer a Labour government than the Liberal government sure. we did have. But in terms of um, really, really kind of naming what's true in terms of what where we are, um, no, no difference really. So, you know, same same playbook. You know, different angle. Uh, different talking heads, but the same. Different talk, different talking. It's a kind of head. It's a kind of head that's talking. Uh, that's it. That's about it. And, you know, it wasn't so long ago that, you know, 20% of Australian forests uh, burned. And they said, you know, over a billion animals died in that. But, but you wouldn't know that now. 
uh, you know, floods have been the thing around here, you know, in recent times. But you, but you sort of wouldn't know that. I always used to laugh um, when I'd see on, you know, National Geographic or uh, David Attenborough and, you know, the, the lions that, you know, come and run into a, a pack of gazelles or something and they'd catch one or they'd almost catch one. The gazelles had just moved like 200 metres down and then that all relaxed. And I thought, you know, that's crazy. There's still a lion around. How can you relax? But we're just the same. <laughs> we're just exactly the same. You know, oh, the fire's gone. We're fine. You know, floods, fine. We're, we're fine. Um, I, I've been intrigued by how similar we are to animals. Um, uh, there is one. There is one piece. There is one piece that I want to speak about be before we end. And maybe there's another question too. I didn't mean to cut off if someone was sitting on something. But um, and that's just another little word about grief here, um, because we live in a grief phobic culture. Uh, so many people have trouble um, heading into the grief realms and. Or if I if I put my foot in there, I'm going to slide into despair, and I'll never get out. And I've got to keep my, you know, I've got to stay positive, and I need to stay up. I mean, that's the message that the culture's given us anyway. Um, but I, I love Francis Weller's work on this, where where he says, you know, we have to trust the intent of grief, that it's here to deepen us and ripen us. Uh, that we have to accompany grief through our life, not come to the end of it and accept and be clear of it, right? We have to learn how to walk with it. And uh, that I think, you know, he he says in his, you know, he's being a therapist for 40 years and Kimberly, I'm sure you would understand this, that mainly what walks into his office is undigested grief. And I would say the same for the clients that I see. So how do we help each other? You know, we, we digest with in company. We digest in company. We need friends for that. We need safe places for that. Shouldn't be privatized. Shouldn't be taken on in some endurance model that we're going to muscle our way through this. We need to share about it. We need to come together and be together about this. this is how we keep our hearts soft it's how we keep open to life. It's how we keep joy flowing through our world. So I sort of wanted to come back to that because there's no sort of stepping away from grief in this story. We can't. We can't. I nor should we try. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, deepening and ripening us. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, we need to stop. And we probably won't because the culture is the way it is, but pathologizing it. Yeah, I know. Like it means there's something wrong with you. Oh, it's so full on, isn't it? You know, it's you know, it's so it's so full on. You know, so people write to me about my document documentary and say you're scaring the kids. You know, you're going to make them sad. It's like, you know, like I'm not scaring anybody. I'm just reporting on what's going on. Do you know what I mean? They have a right to be scared. They have a right to be sad. How about that? You know, yeah, 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 great. And and yeah. Vicky's just asked, do you see a role for black humor? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <I certainly. laughs> Absolutely. Oh my God. Where would I be without it? Yeah. Where would I be without it? Yeah. Mm. Oh, Michael, mm. thank you so much. I'm so, yeah. so grateful. Yeah. For your time. What? and your wisdom and everything you do in the world. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you for having me here. It's great to have a chance to speak. I actually don't get that many chances, to be honest. I'm holding groups or I'm interviewing other people. So it's a real delight for me to be speaking. And thank you for what you're bringing, Kimberly, all the heart you're bringing to the work and your offering about, you know, finding what's yours to do. And thank you all for your questions and your presence and your heart. Um, We'll see you another time, I, I, I hope. If everybody unmutes and just says whatever you want to say at the end here. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks so much, Michael. <clears throat>